Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 209 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. For nearly a thousand years, they've been credited with everything from swaying international politics to guarding the bloodline of Jesus to discovering North America to protecting the Holy Grail. I'm speaking, of course, about the Templars. While much of what's currently said on the internet about the Templars, including almost everything I've just listed, is strictly myth, the real medieval Templars were indeed a formidable fighting force, while at the same time being financially savvy diplomats at many of the major courts of the time. Not just war makers, but peacemakers. This week, I spoke with Dr. Steve Tibble about just one corner of the Templars' operations, that of Great Britain and Ireland. Steve is an honorary research associate of Royal Holloway, University of London, and the author of several books, including Monarchy and Lordships in the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, The Crusader Armies, and The Crusader Strategy, as well as many articles on crusading, which you can find at Medievalist.net. His forthcoming book is Templars, The Knights Who Made Britain. Our conversation on the Templars, their activities on and off the battlefield, and some of the major political events they were involved with is coming up right after this. Thank you, Steve, for coming on to talk about your new book about Britain and the Templars. Thanks for coming on. No, thank you, Danielle. It's a real pleasure. So the Templars, we were just talking off camera, off mic, about how it's a big subject. What made you decide to take on the Templars as your next book? The real attraction is that they're such larger-than-life characters. You know, I, I lead a very simple life. You know, I've, I've got a, an insurance policy, I've got health care, and, you know, I've got sofas. And I really admire people who achieve so much with so little. And it struck me as... As I've been working on different aspects of the Crusades over the years, the thing about the Templars is there were just so few of them, very, very limited in numbers. The things they did and the the way they've echoed through the centuries is extraordinary. So I'm just permanently in awe of them. I mean, I think when I write about the Crusades on, on all sides, it's pretty much a love letter anyway, because I am permanently in awe of these people and their resourcefulness. But I think with the Templars, that they're, they're really... You know, for a small group, it's a really standout achievement on many different levels, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. Yes, absolutely. So when you talk about their achievements, we're going to get into what that specifically means in a minute. But you decided to take on the Templars in Britain, so British Templars. And you mentioned in the, the title of the book that they are some of the people who made Britain. So why did you take on this lens on an international order? Well, that's a really good point. Part of it is hidden in my youth. In my in my youth, after I finished my PhD, I took on a job in advertising. I, I became a strategist in that agency for many years. And so I've always been fascinated by strategy. And in my previous book called The Crusader Strategy, I, I spent a lot of time trying to deconstruct what was actually happening and put it in the context of strategy rather than just thinking of it as a series of events. Because I think a lot of medieval evidence, I mean, you know, the same as me, that when you read a chronicle, it's a series of things happening. It's one thing after another. But it doesn't mean that they didn't have a strategy. What it means is we don't have the email trail. They didn't have the vocabulary. They didn't have the structure for it. But I've always been totally convinced that that actually medieval groups of people were in some ways much more strategic than we are now. And I think we're very patronizing about the medieval period in particular. Mm -hmm. So I think the Templars, for me, were a standout example of of a tiny group with an extraordinarily almost sublime strategy that managed to bring an international order onto the stage of the Middle East, but also in the stage of all the different provinces of Europe. So for the first time, you had a small group who could combine an international military force working for an international agency, the the papacy, trying to do logistically and militarily do grand things and, and diplomatically do grand things on the international sort of arena. And a big part of understanding the strategy of the Templars, because I really do think there is one, is the beautiful way they combined activity in the Latin East with activity in each of the provinces. And because I'm I'm in Britain, it was easier for me to look at the British province, but there, there are many other case studies. And I just loved working on how the two interlocked, how you can have activity on the home front, whether it's diplomacy or investment banking or agriculture, 
and combine that with the needs of an elite military force. I mean, for its period, it's so, so far advanced that it's just beautiful. And equally, the other thing to remember, I guess, is that there are British Templars fighting out in the East, as well as there are Templar brothers lobbying for a crusade, managing an estate more efficiently, and so on. So you get this wonderful juxtaposition of highly professional elite working in two very different spheres, you know, the kind of the elite professionals back at home and the elite warriors on the front line. And to me, that's a, a well, it's an extraordinary mixture. Yes, definitely. Extraordinary is a good word for it because it, they're definitely not ordinary. <laughs> okay, so let's start at the beginning. For the people who have never come across the Templars, except for, you know, maybe the Da Vinci Code, what was their original mandate? Because it's not the same as it was at the end of their period. So what were they originally meant to do in the Holy Land? Yes. Well, you, you almost have to go back to the period just before they existed. So that when, when the Crusaders were about to take Jerusalem, there was a, an amazing meeting took place where they discussed how they were going to manage the operation. If, so if they captured Jerusalem, who was going to be in charge? And everybody, all the, all the secular forces assumed it was going to be a commander. You know, it was going to be somebody military. And I think we would as well. I remember when I, when I first came across that story when I was a kid, I was shocked. And I thought, oh, isn't this really weird? Of course, it's got to be a military commander. But the papacy and the religious delegates all wanted it to be a religious state, which at the time, you know, and to our eyes, looks crazy. So clearly that's not practical. But... but <laughs> But actually, bizarrely, they had stumbled across something very important, which is that it was only with the help of the papacy, really, that you could funnel sufficient military resources through to hold the Latin East. Because most of the Crusaders, they went on pilgrimage, a very, very violent pilgrimage, but then they went home, you know, job done, leaving a very outnumbered and completely indefensible set of Crusader states to be, to be looked after. So you can see that the Templars, as, as the natural conduit, they're, they're a very imaginative, highly creative way of creating an international task force to be operated by an international decision-making body. So it's the papacy, and they were the strong right arm of the papacy out on, out on the ground there. So when they first started, it was a very gradual start, and conspiracists love this because you know, they don't really appear very much for the first decade. And, you know, conspiracists will say, oh, this is because they were already secret and what have you. In, in <laughs> fact, au contraire, it was <laughs> quite the opposite. They were not mentioned because they were so unimportant. They were literally less than 10 men who were basically seemed to have been the kind of security team around the Holy Sepulchre. If they did have a role outside the Holy Sepulchre, guarding things like the True Cross, it was as police officers they used to ride up and down the road to Jaffa or down the road to Jordan and try to make things a little bit safer for travellers and pilgrims who would be coming up from the coast. So it was very humble beginnings. And, you know, there is no mystery about why, why they're so low profile. There's particularly Fulker of Chartres, who wrote, wrote a chronicle at the time. And people always say, oh, well, you know, Fulker didn't mention them. Clearly, there's something going on here. And in fact, Fulker almost certainly knew them. You know, the, the population, the, the Frankish population was small. Fulker lived around the corner. They probably met down the pub or the or the Frankish equivalent. Then, the reason he didn't mention them was because they they weren't doing anything secret or dramatic, and they were tiny. They were they were nine nine bouncers really guarding some very precious valuables and doing the occasional bit of traffic safety stuff. So yeah, um, very very small beginnings. From small beginnings, they rapidly grew. I think that is a really necessary point to make is that they were small. They didn't have this massive mandate to take over the entire Holy Land at the time. In fact, humility is such a good point because one of their symbols is two guys on a horse. Like you can't just have a horse for each guy. It's two guys on one horse. Humility and even poverty is a big part of their order. But then it grew from there. So can you tell us a little bit about how it grew? What were some of the levers that made it grow as quickly and as large as it did? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the poverty you mentioned is a, is a very important point. And that kind of came back to bite them because they were simultaneously poor and rich. Mm -hmm. uh, as you say, you know, two men on a horse, and it's a, that's a very powerful symbol. And as individuals, they were very poor. But to your other point, a large part of their role was to take resources, i.e. riches, and transport them 
generate them and transport them from the west to the east. So from an outsider's perspective, they would often be seen to be hugely rich, even though as individuals they were poor. When the order was suppressed and people went around and basically catalogued all their possessions, so very, very humble, you know, a few silver spoons in, in Britain, you know, nothing big at all. These were not rich men. But as an order, they had to deal with finance and big international deals and transport money to help crusaders, transport money to buy mercenaries and so on. That really was always an important part of their role. But it also was a hidden threat. It was the fact that there were, the, the word treasure might be mentioned, even though they were individually poor, uh, obviously didn't bode too well, given their later reputation. But the, the military aspects of the order grew very quickly, actually. The, the, the turning point in Britain was 1128, when the, the, the master Hugh of Pain, he was on a kind of a road trip around Europe to gather men and money and, and recruits for an attack on Damascus, which King Baldwin II was pulling together. And part of that was going to England and Scotland and recruiting men and you know gathering donations. And it was it was a magical moment. It was all coming together for the for the order then. They were they were succeeding all over Europe, and Bernard of Clairvaux was was obviously very helpful. But they they I think the magic ingredient, their kind of super weapon, was the fact that they could relate and communicate with their European peer group so easily. They were monks, they were pious, they had a spiritual objective which which people could relate to but much more powerfully for the kind of the more hairy end of the the medieval nobility they could they could really relate to the fact that these guys were warriors and they were the best of the best and putting their lives on the line so they had they had a double emotional pull in, in a pious age they could appeal to your religiosity but in an age where people really did value your bravery, your personal skill at arms, your skills as a warrior, that was very powerful as well. And they managed to pull those two off. And the, and the, the order really just exploded from there. Well, it's important to think about the trustworthiness that they were regarded with because of the fact that they have these vows that are very similar to a monk's vows, but they also have the military skill to back it up, which is the ideal combination if you want somebody to help you out in the Middle Ages. And it turns out that that made them actually really trustworthy diplomats. And so you're mentioning that in Britain, it starts to get heated up and Henry I starts to give them land and starts to give them a place at court. And then this becomes really important during the anarchy. So can you tell us the role that the Templars played when things started to go south in England? Yes. Well, that's you're absolutely right. And that's a very important point. And, and basically, the, the strategy they adopted was a very subtle one. And that was that they needed to be neutral and trustworthy. And that meant that they could be a force for peace, which to me is the big irony about the, the Templars. Everybody is, thinks they're fierce and reckless and uh, you know warlike, which which is true. But they are, they're warmongers in the east. When when they're in the west, they're peacemongers par excellence. They're the they're the people who really don't want the west distracted. They want the kings of England or the kings of Scotland to have the leisure and money to launch crusades and to send their people to help with the cause. So. They're resolutely fighting for peace in the, in the West. It's not, they're not just being cynical. It is actually in their interests. It's what the papacy wants. It's what they want, is to have the European states undistracted so they can focus on the Crusades. In practice, this actually worked very well. The Templars were quite subtle about how they did it. But there is a default. So, so on one hand, they are neutral. If there was a truce and you needed to exchange prisoners if you needed somebody to escort somebody's family through through enemy lines, the Templars were very good at that. Uh, everybody trusted them. They had a kind of a religious aspect, but as you quite rightly pointed out, they had they had muscle as well. And this was obviously this is a period that revered muscle and religiosity—a strange combination to our mm -hmm. eyes, but for them it was very important. But beyond that, the other subtlety in the strategy was that they tended to support the status quo. And it's for exactly the same reasons in a way. Uh, and that is they want England or Scotland, i.e. the kings of England or Scotland or Queens, to be able to send people out to the East. So in a way, although if you take the anarchy, 
for example. So we've got Stephen and his wife, Matilda, against the Empress Matilda. Both sides were great fans of the Templars, and it was reciprocated. The, the Templars had good relations with both sides, which is not easy in the middle of the Civil War. I mean, just even the word anarchy, you know, it <laughs> doesn't, doesn't bode well, does it? But they did a magic job of, of keeping that going. Ultimately, though, the King Stephen gave them more land, and they were on his side in a very subtle way. So, you know, they, they weren't fighting for him. They, they couldn't fight against other Christians. And they weren't doing anything so overt that Empress Matilda's side didn't trust them as well. But they did always support the status quo. So, you know, when it came to sorting out the treaty, they were there signing on, on Stephen's side and so on. And, and you find that throughout. The Templars have to deal with people that they don't terribly respect even. But if they're the status quo, if they're God's anointed king, they'll give them the benefit of the doubt and then try and stabilize the kingdom. And I think particularly I think of King John when, <laughs> you know, when we talk about this. You know, the uh, the old poem by A.A. A. Milne of Winnie the Pooh fame, you know, that King John was not a good man. He had his little ways and sometimes no one spoke to him for days and days and days. It's <laughs> It's so true. He was a very untrustworthy character, but the people he could trust were the Templars. It doesn't mean that they liked him, but he was God's anointed king. And if anybody was going to stabilize the kingdom, it was them trying to do it through him. Yeah, they kind of held, I think they held their nose at certain times and just did the best they could with the, the material to hand. <laughs> I think that's so important, especially when we talk about the anarchy, which is where we, we started with this, is that once Stephen was anointed, well, their hands are kind of tied because they are representing the papacy internationally. And once that anointing oil is on the king, well, it's already done. It's done. Yeah, and you know, you I know, and even Empress Matilda, I think, couldn't really argue with that too much, despite the fact that she did have a very good case. But yeah. yes, you do have King John, who is similarly anointed, and so he's the one that they have to follow and support. And you do mention in the book that the Templars are actually at Runnymede when Magna Carta is signed. They're that important yeah. in government yeah. this, at this time. Yeah, and they're on his side. But equally, again, you know, as we were saying, with things like exchanging prisoners and so on, they're 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 neutral. People trust them to be neutral. But behind the scenes, they're also transporting money for King John to his garrisons so that he can pay his mercenaries. So effectively, they're acting as a military logistics operation for King John, but just not in an over, so overt a way that they lose the respect of the other side as well or the trust. I don't know if you remember, like. The days of Serpico, when when New York had had some dodgy police, and uh, I'm sure they don't now. And, yeah, right. uh, yep. <laughs> and, and relationships with you know drug lords. I mean, this is a similar thing where if you want to transport goods or products, in the case of drug lords, you go for trustworthy people and and somebody who can be seen as above the fray, so they they're not going to be in the crossfire. And the Templars took that role on to a large extent, I think, particularly in reigns where. The king was in trouble, you know, and he needed more help. They actually even, even with King John, you find there are areas where they, while they're delivering the money, they are also writing reports about ways in which castles could be improved, or perhaps you can move the garrison. This guy in the garrison doesn't get on with that one. There's a gate that could, the defences could be improved. So behind the scenes, they are actually operating as military consultants, so mm -hmm. as very high-level consultants and logicians, logisticians but still playing that very delicate game where they can be ultimately be trusted in, in discreet diplomatic ways yes. while, while supporting the, the king. It works in the time of King John in that the Pope was on John's side, so that made it kind of clear for them. But then they were actually involved in a muddy dispute earlier when it comes to Henry II and Thomas Becket. They actually were involved in that as well, weren't they? They were, yeah. And again, that... Uh, I'm full of admiration for what they did because they were in such a difficult position. You know, on the one hand, they, they're really wanting to have stability and peace in England and, you know, and, and in the other, the fuller empire, because that will help the Crusades. But on the other hand, Beckett is also part of the church. They're part of the church. So they're desperate to heal these rifts before they go too far and they play they play a big role as diplomats and both sides Beckett's people trusted them and interestingly apropos your point about the kind of muscular nature of the Templars there, there is there is correspondence from actually from Beckett and his advisors saying that they wanted 
the Templars in charge of security if they were going to have a meeting with Henry's people. So you, you can see they're walking a very fine line and they're, they're desperate to make peace. When, when it all goes pear-shaped, when the, the four knights kill Beckett, for them, it's it's a bit of a disaster, really. It shows their campaign of diplomacy. It comes to a really, it's a train crash. But again, you know, all respect to the guys, they they have got a strategy of sorts to make the best of a bad situation. And they use their diplomatic skills and their lobbying skills to guilt trip Henry into providing more and more money and resources for the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem in particular. So it's, you know, the death of Beckett was the last thing they wanted. But, but once it had happened, I always, I'm always struck by how the Templars are good at dealing with what the hand they've been dealt with. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a bad hand. But they deal with it very well and they use it to to get more money for the Latin East. And sadly, you know, when you get things like the Battle of Hattin, I mean, it's, a lot of that was very largely financed by Henry's guilt money. And there were, you know, bands of English mercenaries fighting under the, the royal standard of England on the battlefield at Hatton. And, so, you know, it didn't go well. But the Templars were doing what they needed to do, which was to try and get resources out to help the defence of the Holy Land. Yeah, that's one of the points that you make sort of over and over again, that I think is a really important one, is that they have this one mandate, and they're going to do everything that's necessary to get that money to the East to work on conquering as much as possible for the cause of Christianity. And you talk about it in a lot of cases, like they're a corporation. And I think this is an important way to think of it from our modern perspective, where you have people who are elected to be in charge of it for experience and they are sort of delegating people all over Europe for this one task. Did it help you to think of it as a corporation as you're going through this when you're when you're trying to think about the networks that they're making? Yeah, you're spot on there. Uh, obviously the Middle Ages is a is a world of family businesses, really. I mean even even nation states and empires are family businesses. And I think when you come across an an exception like the Templars or Actually, I ironically like the assassins. I, I think they have the Templars and the assassins have more in common than either of them would have wanted to admit. <laughs> but there is this whole thing, your decision making is different and it can be a lot clearer if you're not worried about whether your son or daughter is going to be up to the responsibilities or if you're worried about your wife going into revolt with one of your younger sons or, you know, there's all kind of crazy permutations and different distractions from clarity of strategy when you're dealing with an extended family. And, and underneath you, you have a bunch of other extended families who are working to, to extend your authority. And it's very complicated. Whereas something like the Templars, I think where they could do really well was they did actually have a consistent strategy. They had corporate objectives. And I think it really is helpful to, you know, obviously that you don't want to stretch it too far, but in terms of what they were doing in the UK, I, I think of them as a, kind of McKinsey meets Deloitte or it's that kind of thing. And and in the and in the East, they're much more like a professional army. I mean clearly they're not professionals in the way that we'd use the term now, but they're much more like a regular army than all the kind of family focused feudal units and so on that they're that are working alongside them. And that gives them better continuity, it gives them better training. They can actually see long-term policies put into action in a way that's not impossible, much more difficult for families that are always, you know, subject to the vagaries of DNA. You know, your <laughs> son or daughter may not be up to the task that you're going to give them. But with the Templars, you you try and get the best man in charge and, and yeah, you have a better chance of continuity. Yeah. And I think that's really important when we think about them as being a fighting force in the East, because they did have better training than most of the other Westerners who were showing up there. And I think that has a lot to do with, as you're saying, there are no politics involved in this because they all have the same objective. So they are able to train together and there's no like, I should be in charge. You know, I mean, I'm sure there was, but not to the same extent that you have, like, for example, Richard the Lionheart and Philip of France, who are... <laughs> You know, oh yeah, Absolutely. I know who's Absolutely. in charge. And yeah. so, can you tell us a little bit about their training, or at least what we know about how they were able to work as a unit when it comes to actually fighting? Yeah, that's a good point. I think the the comparison, the thing you have to bear in mind for context is just how fragmented most of European societies were. You know, you've got very diverse agricultural states. You've got people who 
don't travel far, communications are poor, there's very little economic surplus. So by necessity, troops tend to be in little penny packets just because you can't feed them. You can't keep a a standing army, and even if you could, you couldn't keep them in one place and feed them. There just isn't the surplus. It sounds obscure, but it's actually very important because it means these people never train together. They don't operate as, as units. They certainly don't operate as armies, except very infrequently. The sad benefit of of fighting out in the Crusader states was that you barely needed training. You were in the saddle the whole time and guys were fighting year in, year out. And if they weren't fighting, they were on patrol. And it was it was really, it was kind of the Eastern front of medieval warfare. And the Templars uh, and, and the Hospitallers also, also on top of that. So they have the advantage of being veterans. You know, they have veteran troops in the same way as Alexander the Great's troops are veterans. You know, they may not be totally professional in the way we use the word, but they know their business. And the other thing about the Templars and the Hospitallers is that they've got the money and the continuity to put correct training into into action. And they're able to develop strategies and formations that work very well. And we still have the, the rule of the Templars, which even goes into the detail of saying how you launch a charge, what you do when you don't launch it, who's going to be in the second rank, who's going to be in the third rank. And they even go down to the detail of saying the squires who are in charge of the tent pegs and the soup have to come in the fourth you know, they have to mount a mule and try and do their best in the back as well. They're, they're really detailed about squeezing every bit of military effectiveness out of what they've got. So, yeah, I mean, they've got, they've got a lot going for them that is much more difficult when you're part of a tiny family firm with very limited resources. They can, to an extent, they can rise above that. Yes, exactly. And I'm going to talk about farms for one second before we get into <laughs> what everyone wants to know, which is about the conspiracies. But <laughs> one of the things that I think we are sort of obliquely getting at is the fact that a lot of people leave the Holy Land because they have to get back to their family affairs or their farms back in the West. So with the Templars being sort of a corporation, a group, an organization, they don't have to leave for personal business because this is their business. At the same time, in the greater parts of Europe, you have them creating a whole bunch of resources agriculturally, especially in order to support their effort. And that's one of the things that you mentioned. So the Templars actually build towns in farms in order to support the effort. So can you tell us a, one or two examples of them building towns and farms in order to support them? Yeah, absolutely. Again, going back to my youth, um, for my sins, I did, as well as having a couple of medieval history degrees, I, I did also town planning at Cambridge. When I, nice. when I was a kid, because I thought I might might go into that, but, which I didn't, thankfully. But, <laughs> so I've been absolutely astounded to see that the Templars, a thousand years before all this, before my studies, were doing exactly that. They were building new towns. They were working the regulatory system. They were working the privileges they had. They were looking at clearing land. A lot of a lot of what you find when the Templars are asking kings and queens for for donations, part of what they're asking for is permissions particularly with something called assarting, which, as you probably know, is basically permission to take down a wood and turn it into arable land so that you can create new settlements out of the middle of a wood. And they were so good at doing that because as a corporation, they have resources to to help do it. They've got donations. People love them. So they're going to give them the land. Particularly, you might might give them a wood because, you know, wood isn't very economically productive, but the Templars who actually have a tradition also. I mean, the the military orders and and certainly the church in the East did have quite a tradition of taking deserted villages and making them productive again. So it was was quite a natural thing for them to do that. Some of the Templar barns, there's a place in Cressing, Essex, I think, which are outstanding. They're huge and they're still standing now. I think at least two of them are still standing and still date from that period. They had a more sophisticated way of doing things. Be- and because, as you say quite rightly, they were a corporation, you could be professional troops in the East, but you could also have professional land managers in the West, and they would be helped by professional lawyers and professional lobbyists. So there's a level of professionalism that is hard to achieve uh, in a family business when you're busy worrying about whether your son's capable of doing anything, let alone you know being simultaneously a lawyer or a diplomat and a soldier. it's a tough gig it's a tough gig (laughs) so we need to get into the end of the templars because your book is focusing on the british templars and the british templars experience of the end of the order is different massively different than it was in france so 
Tell us how the end of the order came about. Yeah. What struck me instantly was how, as you say, how different it was, but also how similar it should have been. I mean, the, the British and the French Templars had great connections. In fact, you know, they were continually going on business trips together. Their logistics were very tied in. Their, their financial, the investment banking flows were all going very similar directions. They, they were a good machine. And the obvious conclusion that, that isn't widely talked about is that the British Templars were just as guilty or just as innocent as the French and vice versa. So really, if you if you can prove that one's innocent, you pretty much, to me anyway, you've proved they're all innocent. So the problem from the British side, and particularly the English side, which is where we've got most of the evidence, was that Edward I, who was a great Templar fan, and he you know, fought out with them in the East, he died just before King Philip of France decided to destroy the order, really. And there's a lot of debate about why Philip did that. Was he genuinely credulous? Was he genuinely in need of cash? Uh, I think yes to both, really. I mean, you can you can be greedy and murderous and, <laughs> and superstitious. I, I don't see that as a contradiction. But Edward II had only just come to the throne. I'm funny, he hadn't even been crowned when the Templars were rounded up in France. So they were in a very weak position in England because their biggest supporter had just died, really. The English crown really gave very little indication of thinking they were guilty at all. And in fact, Edward II wrote to as many people as, you know, he basically got out his Rolodex and just went down sending notes to everybody saying, this can't be right. You know, let's behave with a little bit of reflection here before we do anything too hasty. And he, they, they basically just stalled as long as they could. And you can see, actually, they carry on the process stalls for years. And you find other members of the English clergy who are supposed to be prosecuting them find that they've got other engagements and they can't find a window in their diary to come down and, and help prosecute the, the Templars. There's just a marked lack of enthusiasm. And, and you find the same in Ireland when you when you look at the Irish records. The um, people actually went to a great lengths to avoid persecuting the Templars any more than they needed to. Well, certainly, I don't think in Britain that people thought they were guilty. Eventually, it got to the point where there, so many years had passed that the Templars were, were not a going concern. And then they kind of had to just bring it to a conclusion. But I don't think there was much thought that they were genuinely guilty. Do you think that part of it was that, I mean, the, we know that the laws were different, especially when it comes to torture for confession, right? And so if you are torturing, as they did in France, torturing in order to get a confession, you weren't allowed to do this in England. Do you think that there was just sort of a snowball effect of quote unquote evidence from these false confessions yeah. that was enough to twist Edward II's arm? Do you think that had anything to do with it? That's a good point. I, I, I personally don't think it did. I don't think there's a lot to suggest that he really ever thought they were guilty. I, mm -hmm. I don't think they were ever thought of as being guilty. I think what, what did happen was, you're absolutely correct, that torture, you know, that one word explains, the to me, explains the whole of the Templar conspiracies, mm -hmm. where, where you have people who are tortured in France, very often tortured to death. These are brave people. They're not bending over and saying whatever you want. They are tortured to the point of death, people who will die without saying what you want them to say, rather than perjure themselves. But then when you see all your comrades dying, you know, I think there were 36 French Templars tortured to death in the first wave. If you're if you're number 37, you know, I'm in I'm in awe that people would die under torture anyway. If I was number 37, I would be saying whatever people wanted me to say. And and some of the French Templars were very open about that. They, they actually said, I'm, I'm innocent of everything. But if you want to torture me, no worries, I'll tell you whatever you want. As you say, in England and Ireland, there, there was very little recourse to torture. It wasn't part of the normal procedures. Um, there was much less heresy, and the, and the growth of torture was was linked to you know, repression, repression of heretics, which didn't exist so much in Britain. So in the absence of torture, there were no confessions. Really, you know, it's, it couldn't be starker. In, in France, you have tortures and death, you get confessions. In England and Ireland, you have no torture. Everybody says, I can't believe you're asking me these stupid questions. What on earth do you take me for? And all that happens at the end is that I think 
it just becomes boring. You know, they have to bring the process to a conclusion. And there are three particularly vulnerable brothers who are vulnerable for different reasons. Maybe they embezzled something or whatever, who were, I think, probably tortured. And they started saying, oh, yes, all right then. But nothing nothing too major. They, they'd sometimes say, oh, I heard somebody in Spain did something naughty. So even under mild torture, and I, I'm not suggesting that any torture is mild. I mean, I'd, I'd cave instantly. But even even under the, the less severe torture, there was no real evidence coming forward. The, I think the order was closed down in England because it just had to be at that point. The other word that explains the conspiracies and the, the closure is redundancy. So torture, torture is how you can manage the methodology, but redundancy is the, the primary driver, really. No, nobody ever accused the Templars of these kind of things until after 1291 when the Crusader states have collapsed and then suddenly they're redundant. So, yeah, I mean, again, it's not a, not a coincidence. And, if, and again, if they're innocent in, in England and Ireland, then they're almost certainly, they're just as innocent in France. So, yeah, the whole conspiracy thing collapses pretty much straight away, I think. Yes, I think redundancy is an important part of that because one of the things you mentioned in the book, we don't have a lot of time to get into that, but that the Hospitallers, also military order, changed the way they were doing things and they yeah. ended up blasting. They still are around as the Knights of Malta and they got a lot of the Templars land afterwards as it turned <laughs> out. So, you know, yeah. they, they managed to keep themselves relevant. Yeah, you're absolutely right. My old uh, my old supervisor, Jonathan Riley Smith, was... Uh, very proud senior, senior hospitaler. Nice. And yeah, the order still survived. The other thing that I think is very interesting is that when the Templars in England and Ireland were suppressed, the, the major beneficiaries were going to be the hospitalers. And the hospitalers were their great rivals. They really and very intense rivalry. We're not talking about, you know, friendly soccer match kind of rivalry. We're we're talking about, yeah, very intense enmity in some ways. But even then, when the Inquisition was calling for witnesses to come forward to put on oath all the crimes that the Templars had committed. Not a single hospitaler came forward. I mean, it's, it was just, if, if they had been even slightly guilty of any of those things, the Templars were the ones who had most to gain and who had the biggest history of animosity with them. But but in fact, not a single one. They they effectively almost closed ranks. They they looked after their old, old comrades on the way out in a, in a way that I think you know, it's very creditable to them. Mm -hmm. And I think it speaks to the fact that one of the things that you mentioned right at the beginning was that we tend to look down on the Middle Ages, but to see these this group of human beings closing ranks when they know that there is injustice, I think it's one of those things where it's not nice, 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 not the right word for it, but something relatable, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. When you see so many horrors going on at that time, it is good to see that there's a, a more positive side to human nature as well. Yes, absolutely. Right. So there is one last thing about the collapse of the Templars that I think is worth mentioning in the context of Britain. And that is that usually the Templars were accused of worshipping cats. But in Yorkshire, <laughs> it's calves. <laughs> it's calves. What happened? <laughs> yeah, which is fabulous. And to me, it's, it's a minor point, but it's a huge point as well. Basically, what seems to have happened is there was a formula, there was a methodology for how you torture and interrogate people. So, so in France, they had these very detailed, they're like questionnaires, it was like market research, really. You know, do you worship Satan very frequently? Frequently, neither <laughs> frequently nor infrequently. But it was it was almost at that level. And in the in the French questionnaire, they had the, the reference was to to cats. So it was do you basically kiss a cat's bottom, you know, catum. And when they say bottom, it's that's a polite way of saying anus, I think, uh, really. So do you lick a cat's anus? And, and under torture, people will say anything. So, yeah. When, when the questionnaire came over to Britain, they used the same format. So all over Britain, there, there were references to do you kiss a cat's bottom? Except in Yorkshire, where it seems that when somebody was mistranscribing the questionnaire when they went up there. So in Yorkshire and nowhere else in Britain or Europe, as far as I know, they, they wrote catellum instead. So instead of catellum, it was catellum. And this is an easy, easy mistake, but a very crucial one. So in the Yorkshire interrogations, people were asked about kissing calves bottoms, which <laughs> is even, you know, obviously it's absurd. You know, you can imagine, I mean, A, why would you kiss a cat's bottom? But <laughs> it, 
it is just about feasible that you might get a cat inside a chapel. Okay, <laughs> that would be, you know, the might, cats might wander around. But clearly, you're not going to get cattle wandering in <laughs> un, unknown. I mean, these are, you know, basically, they're ordinary men and women living and working in all of these sites. And they probably would have noticed if, if cattle started suddenly going up to mass. Mm-hmm. So that's that's crazy on one level. But given that people were being asked, so these are external witnesses, not the Templars themselves, all the Templars, because they weren't being tortured in Britain, said, no, this is crazy. I can't believe you're asking this. But they managed to get some external witnesses to say that they had. So then you're into the realms of how do you creatively describe the process of kissing a calf's bottom in a, in a, you know, sometimes a relatively small chapel. So there are two particular ones in Yorkshire, one by a, a local priest who must have hated them for, for some reason, who told a story under oath that Templars were obviously doing these kind of things. And then there was another one who was a knight from York, who, again, backed him up and said, yes, yes, we all we all went to uh, supper around at the local uh, Templar place. And they were, you know, they even though they were a secret conspiracy, they they mentioned that they did do, in fact, they mentioned they did kiss calves bottoms, yeah, as you do. So it, it, on one level, it's silly and funny, as well as being very sad. But it also gives us an insight into the methodology. So basically, what was happening was a series of these questions were being given to the Templars. Templars all said no. And then they were just taking these same crazy questionnaires out to anybody they could find. Maybe they were bribing them, maybe they were offering them inducements or, or whatever. And these people would perjure themselves and say, if you told them, to, if you told them to say, you saw the Templars kissing a cat's bottom, they'd say, oh yes, da da da. But then if you changed it and said, you saw them kissing a calf's bottom, didn't you? They'll say, oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, my friend over there, you know, the knight from York, he saw it too. So it just lifts the veil on the whole sordid, ridiculous process. I mean, it's kind of the worst kind of police work that mm-hmm. you can imagine. It's just taking the usual suspects, asking crazy questions, and then intimidating people until they purge themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, again, that speaks volumes for the innocence of the British Templars, which again means the French Templars and the others were just as innocent as well, probably. Yes, I would agree with you. These started to seem ridiculous, but I think we had that impression already. So when the Templars chapels and houses were raided everyone found treasure and they found the holy grail right no they didn't because it was already taken away (laughs) okay tell us about the templar treasure and the holy grail what do you think about it well it's obviously all true as you quite (laughs) rightly said no i'm I'm not a believer i'm afraid and and if you just look at the evidence i mean i'm you know trying to be objective about these things all over Europe, when, when the temples were closed down, people catalogued what they had, particularly in France, where it was a huge surprise. The guys were arrested you know, overnight and the catalogues were drawn up within a matter of hours or days. They were accused of things like trampling, smashing crucifixes, urinating on, on, on Christ on the crucifix, of worshipping false idols and so on. And these idols were described and they were golden and valuable and kept in the treasury. But in reality, you look at the catalogue, there's nothing. They've got valuable crucifixes. They've got simple, unvaluable, just very normal crucifixes. They've got reliquaries in the shapes of heads. But there's nothing out of the ordinary, actually. Quite the opposite. The the Templars are actually very conservative uh, in terms of their their religion, which is not, it's pretty much what you'd expect. I mean, these, these are guys, most of them can't read Latin. They're the muscular arm of Christianity. They're, they're not theologians. And and you find off quite often they give the wrong answers under under questioning in France and 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 occasionally in England as well. But it's not because they've been tortured particularly or because they're heretics. It's because they genuinely don't know the answer. You know they mm-hmm. they might have only just joined a couple of weeks earlier, or they genuinely don't know whether something is a, a sin or something that needs penance or, or whatever. You know there's the minutia of it. These guys were not by and large literate theologians who were desperately looking into the minutia of Christianity. This was the these were people who were trained to charge <laughs> rather than trained to, you know, to, to read. I think one of the reasons that the catalogues were originally produced was Philip of France hoped that they would produce evidence of heresy, because you would expect them to. And uh, they were never produced at the trials. And I think it's, it's because there was no evidence there. And it's the same in, same in England uh, when the catalogues were done. You, I think there's one silver spoon for every two Templars in England. Mm-hmm. These were not 
rich people. These were not heretics. There were no satanic idols. There were no crucifixes that had been damaged. It's quite the contrary. These are very, very orthodox, quite quite conservative, conservative with the small c religious folk. Yeah. And so what you see is Philip reading onto them what he needs to read onto them in order to take their wealth. And one of the points you make in the book is that we're still doing this. We're using the Templars as a blank <laughs> slate, you say, as a blank slate for our needs. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I love the Shakespeare debate as well, you know, because obviously Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. But <laughs> what's, what's really interesting is why anybody would think he didn't. You know, what does it say about us as, as people and, and our needs and, our, I don't know, our emotional needs, perhaps to find escape through conspiracies? I mean, if, if particularly as the world gets less religious, I think a lot of us would find comfort from having some kind of deus ex machina, even if it's not a not a real god, where we can say, oh, well, it's lizard men, or it's the Illuminati, <laughs> or it's, you know, Templars guarding Marie Antoinette's treasure. They, you know, we like to feel that there are people, maybe like is the wrong word, but we have an emotional need for the idea that there is some controlling or some purpose in the world. And conspiracies give us a kind of shortcut to an idea of purpose. And I think that the Templars, that they're really good for doing that. So I totally understand why people enjoy the Templar conspiracies. And I sort of enjoy them occasionally as well. I don't believe them, but, you know, it's a, it's a story. If you look at the hospitalers, when I was a kid, I ended up, for my PhD, doing a huge amount of work on the hospitaler, cartularies, and they're so dull. You know, they're literally, you want to rip your head off going through... <laughs> going through how dull it all is and you know these minute legal arguments that rumble on for decades because they're, they're corporations and they've got lawyers and they've got nothing better to do the, the trouble with the templars is they were accused of crazy things and over time all their records have been lost they, they still existed during the trials but they, they were lost up probably when cyprus was was lost to the ottomans but the hospitalers, we still have all their records. So you look at the hospital records and the idea of seeing a, a, some kind of lizard man kind of world controlling conspiracy is laughable. You know, these are people who are doing little ink drawings of the size of a drain pipe, you know, because they've got an argument about the drainage in the lower field and they've had it for 200 years. And the Templar records, I'm sure, were exactly as boring as that. I mean, first, you know, they were good lawyers. They would have been fastidious and it's all that. And I think the fact that the, the records were lost means that it's a blank canvas. All the dull reality is gone. And we can we can imagine that what actually the records would have said was, oh, you know, Tuesday, bought bought the Holy Grail, got a great price, you know, <laughs> da, da, da. Oh, yeah, we went for the sort of shout of Turin this week or whatever. You know, you you can you can read anything on it because there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. And instead of dull reality, you've got your imagination and you can magnify. I think the, the sad thing about the Templars is, and the one reason why they put themselves up while they are suitable as a as a as a group for conspiracy theories is that they were so remarkable that they were a small group of people who achieved a huge amount and but the trouble is you can magnify that and and pervert it to make them sound like they're controlling the world or discovered america or created an empire or you know won the battle of bankburn or any whatever kind of crazy things you want or that they're living on the dark side of the moon with hitler and elvis you know there's <laughs> there's no there's no end to the fun you can have with it but it's in the absence of evidence yeah it's much easier to, to disprove something when you have evidence is it, than it is to disprove something when there isn't evidence you know you can't say there are no fairies to you because you know i, I don't have evidence that there aren't fairies but equally the the key thing is i don't have evidence that there are fairies and I, I, to me the temple is firmly in that category <laughs> but that is what keeps people going at the pub <laughs> oh i know i know and and we need everything we can to keep the british pub still economically active and i think there's generations of templar bores and pub bores who uh yeah do a good job Well, I think as with anything, the reality is a lot more interesting. And I'm hoping that people will enjoy your book and get to know the British Templars more than they already do from going down to the pub. So (laughs) thank you so much, Steve, for coming on to talk about the British Templars. Thank you, Danielle. Really enjoyed that. For more on Steve's work, you can visit his website at stevetibble.com. His new book, Templars, The Knights Who Made Britain, comes out September 12th. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey, but before I say that, we just got to talk about the news that you just got. What you just got. 
Yes, yes. I've just got, and we're recording this before it comes out, obviously. <laughs> I just got an advanced copy of my new book, Chivalry and Courtesy. Like it's actually a physical copy that I can hold in my hand. It has arrived. So what does it look? Tell me, uh, you just showed it to me really quickly over the video feed, but how does it feel? I mean, it is exactly the same format as How to Live Like a Monk. So it is that beautiful hardcover. It's got Anna Lobanova's art on the front. And it's got a lot of medieval manuscript art and artifacts inside. So it's very beautifully illustrated from Abbeville Press, which is an art press, which is why it's just a gorgeous looking book. So it is here. It, the advanced copies are here. And how does it smell? It's got new book smell, new oh, book smell. Yay, that is, that is the best. <laughs> yeah, I really like this format. So yeah, it's here. And Abbeville tells me that the pre-orders have been quite good for this book already. So I guess I can announce to people now that there is going to be an ebook version of Chivalry and Courtesy, and there's going to be an audiobook version as well. And I'm going to try and get that as close to at the same time as the release date, which is October 3rd for the hardcover. So, yeah, you can get it in all three formats. And the audiobook version is you doing the audio. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to so. be reading the audio. So if you can't get enough of my dulcet tones every week, you can yes. get the audiobook version of this too. Indeed, indeed. Oh, so, oh, congratulations. Thank the, you. It must be the best experience, getting your books. It's nerve-wracking, not going to lie, because I really want people to like it. And I'm really, I want to take a second to be really grateful to all the people that have pre-ordered. So if you don't know much about the book publishing business, the pre-orders are super important because they make your book get a lot of sort of front page news on Amazon site. So it's really, really important to have pre-orders. So thank you to everyone who has already pre-ordered. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about Chivalry and Courtesy, I mean, pre-order it. It comes out October 3rd. Sounds sweet. Sounds sweet. Thanks, Peter, for plugging the book. And what is going on on Medievalist.net? So uh, two news stories I want to talk about this week. First, Vlad the Impaler is still making headlines. Of course. Yeah. You know, and And this is really freaky. So Italian researchers were able to find three letters he wrote, and like one of them even includes his signature. And so they're able to use chemical tests on the paper, and they were able to extract molecules from this paper mm -hmm. and figure out which were the oldest molecules. So they figured if the oldest molecules from a human being would be his, right? Eh, maybe, maybe. And so if they're right, and they were able to test, and they found out that if it's him, these molecules belong to him. He had, had, would have suffered from a skin condition. He had respiratory issues. And he had something called hemolacria, which is the disease that makes you have tears of blood. No, no, really? <laughs> indeed, indeed. So in the article, they actually mentioned there might be also a historical source that kind of says he may have had tears of blood. So this would line up with that, but... <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. I thought you were going to say, and they found in this trace of his DNA that he had vampirism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but tears of blood, that is yeah, pretty spectacular. Wow. Yeah. So so we've got the news on that. Plus, we have a piece about this discovered document related to the Norman conquest of England in 1066. A person uh, named Nicholas Carnell, University of Southampton. He was able to put together this long lost writ of William I to the people of London. It was probably done in 1067 or 1068, and where he kind of grants them the right to live in the city and use the waterfront. And he kind of says, this is my land, but I will give it to you, you know, mm -hmm. so although you live on it. The important thing about it is that Nicholas suggests that this is part of a, a system that was taking place where all the kind of English land loan owners, all the abbeys and stuff like that were paying off William to get all their rights back because they had become, quote unquote, rebels mm -hmm. when they were with uh, Harold, Harold Godwinson. Mm -hmm. And now now they have to pay through the nose. And this is just an uh, example that the Londoners also had to pay a nice hefty fee to be able to live under the new king. <laughs> I'm sure they were all so grateful for the privilege. Yes, yes. They put it down in some of their records from the 14th and 15th century. It survives. It was interesting how they edited out various parts of this. 
for their own benefit. But Nicholas was kind of able to put together what it probably would have read like when it was first issued in Old English back in 1067. Wow, that's a really important document. I think you can learn so much from that kind of administrative detail and read between the lines and find out what it was like to actually live at that time. Yeah, so those kind of pieces, plus if you like Steve Tibble, there are more articles on Medievalist.net that he's written. He's very generous in sending us material. So thanks, Steve, and thanks to all of my contributors. They're doing some great work. Awesome. Thanks so much, Peter. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to everyone who supports my podcast, as well as other indie podcasts and historians through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Patrons can access all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of Medievalist.net and this podcast. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalist. For everything from Templars and Treasure to how to measure, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabolski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. You can even pre-order my new book, Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World, which comes out October 3rd. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an awesome day. Awesome.